Hi everyone, how you doing? Everyone awake after the keynote, ready to rock? Day two, not too much uh, alcohol and barbecue last night. That's certainly my case. Um, hi everyone, my name's Dave. I work for these guys, underscore. And I'm here to talk about a uh, functional programming pattern. A pattern which is really useful and ubiquitous and uh, hopefully you will have all used it to some degree or you will all know that you've used it by the end of the talk. And that's the interpreter pattern. So before I start, quick show of hands. Who has used the free monad in their code? Okay, great. So some folks, that's great. Uh, maybe 25% of people. Who has used tagless, finally tagless, final tagless? Okay, about the same number, about 25%. Okay, so for you people, you probably know everything that I'm about to talk about. So bad luck, sorry. Um, this talk is aimed at uh, uh, people who don't know anything about interpreters and want to go from, from sort of zero upwards. Um, uh, and we'll get to the point where we've sort of justified what the free monad is and sort of why it exists. So, and a caveat, some of this stuff is stuff that I've researched the first time for this talk. So if I make any errors, please do point them out in the, in the questions at the end. Um, oh, one last question. Who's, who's used an interpreter? Who's written an interpreter in their, in their code? Okay, so I would hope at least all the people who have who've, who've put their hands up for free monad and, and, and finally taglers also put their hands up there, but it's about the same number. Okay, so I'm sure, um, you know, we're all programmers. We spend most of our time working in general purpose programming languages like Scala. Uh, and the great thing about general purpose programming languages is you can do anything in them. And the bad thing about general purpose programming languages, you can do anything in them. And that makes it difficult to reason about your code. So we spend our lives working, building programs, and by programs I mean things that compute a result um, uh, in, in Scala. Um, and sometimes we get mud in, in, in implementation details and complexity um, because our language is so general. So the idea of the interpreter pattern is we shift from writing code in Scala to writing code in some DSL. We invent a domain-specific language, something that's really good at solving one type of problem that we have to solve again and again in our application, and then we shift to that. And because it's higher level and it's simpler, it's easier to code. But the problem is you can't just run a DSL, right? It doesn't have any, it's, it's just a high level thing. It doesn't have uh, any, um, a, 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 any a runtime environment. So we have to provide that and we have to split our programs into the, sorry, split our code base into programs written in the DSL and, interp and an interpreter to run the DSL. So if we perform this split, then the programs we're writing describe a computation we want to run. They don't on, the, on their own do anything. They're just a sort of a structure or a, a set of method calls that sit there and say, these are some steps I wish to perform and then the interpreter has all the low-level implementation detail to implement those steps. So the purpose of this talk is to uh, justify why this is a useful pattern and show you some different ways you can use it in your code base, and we'll talk about free, and we'll talk about finally tagless. So the big thing that we get, ah, I see, it didn't advance when I went there. Okay, I've got the old uh, failing, failing uh, clicker. Um, problem. Okay, so the big reason why we do this, by the way, is that it gives us reusability and modularity. So from the interpreter's point of view, we spend all this time solving low-level technical issues in our interpreter, and then that gives us, uh, gives us the ability to reuse it again and again with programs. So all these programs in our DSL, easy to write, nice and high level, and we get to reuse that time we've invested in that interpreter. So that's one really good bit of reuse and modularity we get. From the program's point of view, the other cool thing is that we can write multiple interpreters to interpret a program. And why would we do that? Well, we can do different things with them. So we might just have a normal interpreter which runs the code. We might pretty print it. We might uh, have the equivalent of an SQL explain. So uh, at Underscore recently, in fact, at Flatmap, we had uh, two guys from Underscore gave a talk about a thing called DroidSpeak. I'll elide all the details. Suffice to say, DroidSpeak is a thing which can tell you why it made a decision as well as the decision it made, which is really good for analyzing sort of use cases in, in, in business. And because we can build multiple interpreters, we can also do a big thing, which is abstracting across effects. So we can have an asynchronous interpreter or an interpreter that fails gracefully in a number of different ways. And that, with that, we can uh, reuse the same code base, maybe to do streaming data or big data analytics, have the same programs, different interpreters, or we can run code in production and in test. One final use case, we can write uh, interpreters that output other programs. 
and these are called compilers, okay, or transpilers if you're a hipster. So um, yeah, so if, if we have a program, we can maybe rearrange things and optimize some steps. So things like Haxel is the um, library which will um, optimize calls to, to microservices to reduce the number of requests you're making and, 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 and batch them together. So a bunch of use cases. I'm going to concentrate mainly on the first three here because this inspect and rewrite programs one, the compiler one, it turns out that some we have to be quite um, uh, specific about the way we build our DSLs uh, to, to allow us to do that. And I'll show you some cases where we start to move into territory where we can't do that anymore. Uh, but we're sort of looking at these four use cases. So now what I want to do is I want to talk to you about ways you can produce all this stuff. And there are really two big approaches to interpreters. Uh, there are these things called reified or approaches to DSLs. There are these things called reified DSLs, which is basically building a data structure to represent. Reification is turning code into data. So we build a data structure representing a program we want to run, and then we pass that to an interpreter. And then there's a thing called church encoding, which is more or less an equivalent way of doing things where we represent programs as sequences of method calls, abstract method calls. And I'll, I'll run through both of those. We'll spend most of our time on reification. Um, and a little bit of time on church encoding. And the reason I'm talking about those, these two things is that the natural extent of reification is the free monad and all of that stuff that other people talk about. And then the, uh, the, the, the um, natural extent of church encoding is this tagless final thing. So they kind of fit very neatly into these two camps. There's one other thing that I want you to consider as we're going through the talk, and I won't, this won't be a for, uh, 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 in the foreground in the talk, but it'll be there in the background, is that there's also an, um, like a, a, a gradient of design of a DSL as to how standalone or how deeply embedded it is in the host language. So we're building a DSL to run in Scala, and we can use very little of Scala uh, as part of our DSL, or we can really lean heavily on Scala. We can use variable definitions and types and implicits and all these things. And so there is uh, definitely a gradient here where the more deeply we embed our uh, DSL in Scala, the more closely the semantics align with Scala, uh, the, 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 the easier it is to write because we reuse things that are given to us in the language. But then we have to make some sacrifices in terms of this inspectability of programs. Okay. So let's talk about some rarefied encodings. I want to start with a little example. The hello world of interpreters is a calculator. Okay, So um, we're going to try and model. Well, that's pretty small. Can everyone see that? That's good, because I can't change the font size. Um, we wanna, we're going to model addition and multiplication of integers. Really, really basic stuff. Okay, So if I wanted to model programs like this in Scala, I would simply wrap them in a function. So this is a program according to my definition. It's a thing which is inert. It doesn't actually do anything on its own, right? but it represents some intent, some computation we want to run. And then the way we run it is we interpret it, or we call it. Okay. So when we're talking about the interpreter pattern, what we're actually talking about is building things like this program at the top, and then uh, some interpreter to run them. So this eval method takes the function and somehow produces a result. Now, a mental game for you. Have a quick think about how you would implement that function. OK, everyone got it? OK, you can implement eval. Now think about the, all the different ways you can implement eval. How, mu how much flexibility have you got in here? Put it another way, how much can you tell about the programs that are being passed into eval when you go to implement it? And you'll soon realize, no, this is, this is you know, pretty, pretty basic, functions in Scala are opaque. We can't see inside them. Okay? So we, we've really, apart from a couple of trivial uh, different uh, ways of re-implementing eval, we really only have one solution here. We can, we can call the function. We can't see inside it. We can't abstract over effects. We can't provide meaningful different interpreters, um, apart from maybe some exception handling or something like this. And so this code is great. It's fine for our use case, but it doesn't give us any flexibility. So let's rebuild that and give, uh, give us some flexibility. So what we're going to do is we're going to reify the language you're using to build these programs, so the additions, the multiplications, and the integers. And we can do that by building an algebraic data type. So it's an expression type. We either have a literal, which wraps up an integer, or we can add two expressions, or we can multiply them. OK? It's pretty straightforward. And then we can represent programs by nesting these things together. So this is the same 
program I showed you earlier, right? It looks a little different because we, we're not using infix operators, and of course we can build nice syntax to make that, um, make that all nice. I'll refer you to other talks for that. Um, but then um, we can't just run this expression on its own, right? We need to build something to run it, so we need our eval, um, our interpreter, our eval function. And because this thing is an uh, algebraic data type, a sealed trait, then the natural way to implement it is by pattern matching. And we can just switch on what type of expression we've got, and we either recursively call eval if we have sub-expressions, or we simply return the result if we've got a literal. OK, so this is obviously a lot more code than we had previously, right? We've gone from like a one-line function to, I don't know, 10, 12 lines of code. But it's given us a bunch of flexibility already. OK, so this is my interpreter that we, we've already written. I can also write an uh, asynchronous interpreter. So this one will, whenever we have an add or a multiply, it will spawn them off as new futures and uh, then flat map on the results to combine them together. So we can run expressions in parallel. Here's one which will reconstruct our expressions as a string. You might notice, by the way, that this thing doesn't correctly bracket the pluses and multiplies when they're nested together. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise, uh, an exercise to you. But the principle is there. We can produce different kinds of results out of this. And we can recompile our programs. So this is the, the analysis and recompilation step. This is multiplying out the brackets. So if I have a multiplication of two sums, it will turn into a sum of several multiplications. And the big take-home point here is that we've simplified our language. We've made it much more restrictive. Okay? We can only represent um, pluses and multiplications. You don't have all of Scala at our disposal. And because we've done that, we've enabled all of these operations in our interpreter. And this is a very Runar thing. So did anyone see, so this is a, uh, Runar's keynote at Scala Exchange, Constraints Liberate Liberty Constraints. It's all about this. It's really, really, really great talk if you want to go and check that out online later. OK, so um, that's, um, that's a basic DSL. But then I'm sure you're thinking, well, what about types? OK, can we do this stuff with types? Um, and there are a few different ways of, of representing types DSLs in Scala. So we'll go through them now. The simplest one is uh, uh, what we call an untyped DSL. So the idea here is we're pushing type checking into the interpreter. So I'm going to switch uh, the um, problem space a little bit. I'm going to introduce Boolean operators and comparisons. So this means we can have type errors now if we um, write these things in the wrong order. Okay. Um, so OK, let's reify it. I've got a, a, a new expression type. I'm using less than now, LT and AND, rather than add and multiply. But you can imagine having as many operators as you possibly want in, the, in this thing. And with this expression type, I can build uh, programs just like I could before. So 1 is less than 2, AND 3 is less than 4. But I can also produce invalid programs. 1 AND 2 is less than 3 AND 4. This is nonsensical. And then we. This is fine for our representation of our uh, DSL and for our programs, but it causes problems when we implement eval. So now it's up to us as language designers to decide what to do, right? If we were JavaScript, we would just say anything goes. Like any operator in JavaScript will just work on any two things and throw caution to the wind. And you know, you can hear many people talking about the idiosyncratic qualities of JavaScript that stem from this decision, but it's trying to avoid runtime errors. But as Scala programmers, we're probably a bit, bit more principled. So we have to deal with a couple of problems in this interpreter. So one is, we've got an expression. What's it going to evaluate to, a Boolean or an integer? We need to ha handle that somehow. And another is, well, OK, well, I might be given an expression that has um, type errors in it. How am I going to handle those type errors? And then expanding things out a little bit, um, if I'm evaluating an expression and I have a sub-expression that's not the right type, how do I deal with that? OK, so I'm sure many of you are screaming at me to use something here. Give me call, call out. What am I going to, what's my return type going to look like on this? Did I hear an either? Hands up for either? Ah, oh, good, excellent. Everyone's paying attention. So we can, we can deal with these errors here by having an either. We just have some error type, whatever. So we can fail or we can succeed. Um, if we can deal with this problem of like Booleans or integers, maybe by adding in an algebraic data type to represent the types we're going to compute, either an integer or, a, or a, 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 a Boolean. And then when we're dealing with the sub-expressions here, 
we're going to have to deal with these either's. So I've put some helper methods in here that I haven't introduced in the code. They would call eval, try to parse the thing as an integer or a boolean and fail or succeed, right? Okay, so what we've done here is we have, um, we have a fairly high mismatch of semantics between our DSL and Scala. DSL is untyped, Scala is strongly typed. And because we've got that mismatch, we have to do all this work. Our interpreter becomes more complicated. Okay. So, uh, and what's more, we can have programs that are just invalid and will never work. So um, there's, a, there's a sensible question is, can we, can we make this simpler? Can we make it more reliable? And of course, the answer is to add types into our DSL. So let's do that. Um, we start with our expression that we had before, and I'm just going to type every, every term in this expression language. So an expression yields a result of type A, and we have a literal, which wraps up any value of type A, and less than will wrap up two expressions of an integer, and, and, and yield a Boolean, and and will combine two Booleans into a Boolean. So just by doing this, we get a whole bunch for free. We can still write exactly the same code to represent our programs. The Scala compiler will, will check the, uh, the, the result types and how they match together on less than an and. So it will say, this is a compiler error if I try to put an, a literal, which is an integer expression inside an and, which expects a Boolean expression. So that's for free. And our interpreter now is back to being really trivial, right? We've got type safety in our language, and because we're using the same type system that Scala's using, there's no mismatch here, the, the Scala compiler can easily make sure we're doing all the right things in our eval. And, you know, we can do all the same things. <laughs> Parallel, execution, pretty printing, simplification, and so on. Okay. So the, the idea here is we're making our language closer to Scala. We're aligning it with Scala, and we're getting uh, a simpler uh, interpreter there. But I want to take a little bit of a moment here to talk about something else, uh, a, a little side issue here, which actually kind of uh, makes things a little bit more interesting. And that's to do with ordering. Now, we built a really, really basic DSL here. And uh, I'm, have you noticed that it has an implicit ordering based in it? So when I'm evaluating a less than there, I evaluate the left-hand side and then the right-hand side. For this language, that's completely fine. Like, it doesn't matter. It's all pure expressions. The ordering doesn't matter. But in, a general, in general, we're building these interpreters to mask some kind of horrible thing, like mutable state or, or um, some other kind of effect. And sometimes, like side effects, sometimes this order is going to matter. So in most non-trivial DSLs, we want the programmer to choose that ordering for us. So there's a question here about how, can we build an explicit ordering into our DSL? Now, what functional programming construct do we use for ordering of things, to sequence things together? Monads, yes. So finally, the M word arrives. And w so we can do this by building in a monad. OK, so we're going to make our DSL monadic. And um, uh, hopefully, this is, this is relatively straightforward. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the expression language we've got, and we're going to add a new type of expression. And this is going to be the expression that will do the sequencing. So this is a flat map expression. I've just named it after the flat map method because it's basically that thing. So a flat map expression basically pairs two other expressions together. We have an expression A, which will yield a value of A. And then we have a function which will take a value of A and yield an expression of B. So then if we were going to interpret this flat map, if we're going to run it, what we do is run, it, run the first expression, take the value, pass it into the function, get back an expression, and run the second expression. Okay, and this is just like flat map in an option or flat map in a in a list. Okay. Now, one interesting thing is this flat map thing is now dealing with our ordering, so we can actually simplify less than an and. Notice that they're wrapping up other expressions. We have sub expressions here, and the only reason we've done that is because that allows us to to have some kind of implicit ordering in our language. You evaluate the sub expressions and then you compare them, or you evaluate the sub-expressions and you add them together. And we don't need that anymore, because FlatMap is going to do all this stuff for us. So we can just say, less than an AND are now just primitive operations. So the first three cases in my expression here are steps in my program. And the last one tells, tells you how to order the steps together. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, I've got a few nods. OK, all right. is, any, is anyone feeling slightly lost? OK, a couple of people. OK, that's right. This, this, this is fine. Uh, I, I will show you how it all hangs together. Oh, one more thing. I'm going to rename literal there to pure. 
because if you use if you use cats, then your your monad has flat map and pure, and literal is and a pure is a way of taking a value and putting it into a, in this case an expression. So it's just a, a terminological difference, but it's still the same thing. So we can no longer do this, right? We can't write our programs the same way we were writing them before because and and less than don't have expressions as their parameters. So we can't directly push expressions together. But what we can do is use flat map to sequence these things. Brace yourselves. This is what the code looks like now. <coughs> so follow it through though, okay? We, these flat maps are all say they all have two parameters. The first parameter is an expression to run, and the second parameter is a thing to do with the result. Okay? So the first line, here's an expression just gives me the value one, and then I have a function that tells me what to do next. And the next bit is, okay, I'm going to take the value two and I have a function to tell me what to do next. And the next one is, okay, well now I'm inside two nested functions. I've got A and B. These are the two integers computed from the first and second steps. I can less than them. And then I have a function to deal with the result. So we, go, we work all the way through to the end. So A and B, we less than them. C and D, we less than them. We and that, and then we, we return the result at the end. We wrap it in a pure just to make the types work. Now, with a little bit, if we sort of add some methods, some flat map methods here and there, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a link to the full code later so you can look at that, we can end up with something like this. Okay? And it's just the same structure, but we've just used a for comprehension. So we, and all we need to do to do this is add a flat map and map expression um, method onto expression. So, um, so you can really see the sequence here. And as a developer, you can you know, just flip two, uh, flip two lines over to change the order of evaluation. Um, you're obviously not going to be able to move a line too high or too low in the program if you need to use its, uh, uh, its result later on. So we've kind of, by aligning ourselves with Scala and four comprehensions now, we've got ordering in our DSL without really having to do too much extra. And our interpreter is kind of nice as well. If we've got a pure, we just yield the value. If we've got a less than, well, A and B are just integers, so we just compare them. If we've got an and, we just do the and. And flat map there, does exactly what we said it would do. It evaluates the first expression, takes the result, calls a function, and evaluates the second expression. You, you kind of can't be more explicit than that. It's kind of kind of really pretty, I think. <coughs> so we've got uh, we've got the ability to write this. We could write um, you know a sort of uh, a parallel version of this. I'm, I'm, this is a little bit um, this is a, this is actually not in parallel because I haven't implemented flat map properly there. But y you can you can sort that out yourself. But, so we can build different types of interpreters to do different types of result, but we've now kind of lost some abilities. Think about how you'd implement pretty print on this language, right? We kind of have a bit of a problem here. We've got this flat map, and I'm not really sure what to do with that. How would we reconstruct some kind of, um, some kind of uh, uh, um, string representation of this? I'm sure there are ways of doing it, and we could probably maybe build a list of strings of all the things we've done in order, but we're making life more difficult for ourselves. And we're making life more difficult because we're starting to build in Scala functions here. And we, the, probably the easiest way to pretty print this thing is to interpret the whole thing into, compile it into another data structure where we um, can more easily represent the sequence of computations directly. Okay. And, and when it comes to simplifying things or rewriting them, all bets are off. Like This is quite difficult to deal with now. So I'm not going to say it's impossible to do these kinds of things. I'm going to say you're making life much harder for yourselves. And the, the idea here is uh, we've made our language kind of more general here. By implement, in, introducing this flat map step, we've added a whole bunch of extra capabilities. We can actually do arbitrary Scala code in the middle of our DSL, right? Because you've got that Scala function. And by introducing that, we've dramatically reduced our ability to kind of look at a whole program from the top down and just fiddle with it. But it's much easier to write the interpreter, and we get all these different types of modularity for free. So for most people, for most cases, this is a really good way of proceeding. So the next step, there's going to be a little bit of sleight of hand here. Uh, I'm going to raise a question. Do we need to write flat map for ourselves? So this idea about having a DSL that has a flat map step is probably a very common thing that you could apply to a lot of different DSLs, right? You just have an expression type that has maybe not less than an add, maybe add and multiply, or different steps, and then a flat map. So should we have to write that ourselves? Isn't this something that some other clever functional program will have written for us? And uh, that is the case, because we're kind of venturing into free monads territory here. So this is kind of 
where the free monad comes in. And the idea of the free monad is to take this pure and flat map step and remove them from our code and make them library code that we can reuse. And that has a number of extra uh, cool things, um, uh, cool properties, things that it allows us to do. So I'll come to them in a minute. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of get to having written free ourselves to show, show you basically kind of open the curtain, show you the, the man behind the curtain. There's no magic. This is, this is what it is. And what we have to do is we have to split our DSL into two. So we're going to split it into the bit that does all the semantic stuff, less than and and, and then the bit that does the sequencing. So there we go. So now we have steps at the top and then monady things at the bottom, right? So we'll, I'm now going to say we're going to, we're going to make these different data types. So I'm going to rename them both. So the thing at the top, I'm going to call an algebra, expression algebra. And that is basically because in all the free monad literature, they, they, they talk about the al an algebra as being the bit you plug into the free monad to make your DSL. And that describes basically the different sets of operations we could do to combine terms, in our, or to combine values, rather, in our, in our DSL. So these are the things we're going to have every step of our full comprehension. And then at the bottom, pure and flat map here become some kind of monad. So it's a, I'm calling it an expression monad for now. So I can either wrap up a value and turn it into an instance of the expression monad, or I can take two other instances of the expression monad and sequence them together. Okay, Sequencing the bottom steps at the top. And I'm going to add one more step at the bottom, because the way I had this here, there's actually no way of taking an instance of the algebra and putting it inside this monad. So there's no expert alg type at the bottom half of the slide. So I'll just introduce one more type in here. Uh, and the, the, the terminology used certainly in CATS is suspend. And that just says, OK, well, here's a step. Here's, here's a step in our, from our algebra. And we're going to wrap it up as a, just a simple um, instance of the monad. So then this part here is uh, our free monad. This is tailored to expression. OK, so it's not free. It's not context free. It's not. Uh, situation independent, but what we can do is remove expression whoop, and produce some fairly abstract looking code where we're not saying we have expression at anymore, but we have this type f. So it's a, a type that takes one type, a type constructor that takes one type parameter. And that, if we go back, oh, if I go forwards, expression algebra takes one type parameter. So the idea is we can have a free of expression algebra, and that is basically what we had before. So we can wrap up a, pure, a simple value. We can take an, uh, an instance of expression algebra and suspend it or put it into the monad. And we can sequence two instances of the monad together. So when we combine that with our expression, we get something that looks a bit like this. So this is a program now written using uh, this way of doing things. Uh, so I wrote this code directly on the slide. I suspect if you do this, there'll be some um, some type errors, some variance issues. You might need to have some helper methods in here to make the, type, the compiler happy. But this is showing you the structure of a program. So you see we've got this monad, flat map, flat map, flat map, flat map, pure. And at every step in there, we've either got just a value being introduced or we have a step wrapped in suspend. And it's still exactly the same program we had before, but this is just the minimal work we need to do to separate these two things out. And then we can take free from a library rather than having to implement it ourselves. And you could kind of see it written like this. In fact, actually, you don't normally write a free monad program like this. The, the normal technique is you find your favorite functional programming library. Uh, you pull in uh, the free data type from that programming library. And you normally take your algebra and you type alias wrapping free around it. So that the kind of the programs I'm going to build, the expressions, which are the programs, are a combination of free and the algebra. So it's you know, this, this, this nested structure. You type alias it, and then you use a bunch of helper methods to produce every step. So don't worry too much about the details. I've got a function here called literal, a function called lit, uh, less than, a function called and, and a function, oh, whoops, old version of the slides, a function called fail, which we're going to ignore from the next slide onwards. But we've got. Um, We've got functions to basically take individual steps in our program and wrap them up in free so that we can then do this with them. So all we're doing really, if you look at the line for x and the line for y, they're just less than. If I go back, they were suspend of less than. So all we're doing is making our lives a little bit simpler. So what you typically do, you build these helper methods, you have your program which is written very simply, and then 
you can run that through an interpreter. And what the interpret and, and the interpreter is kind of going to be two parts, right? There's one part of the interpreter that's going to deal with free, and there's going to be one part of the interpreter that's going to deal with the expression algebra. And the one for free is given to us, and we just have to implement the one for the expression algebra. And it kind of, this is the code, it kind of looks like this. Um, it's a, a natural transformation. Uh, but y it's basically, see this apply method, it's taking an instance of expression algebra and turning it into an instance of something else, like a future or an option or an either, another type constructor. So all we have to do is say, this is how you do these two steps, the less than and the and, and then you can pass that, the free, free in cats has got this method called fold map, you provide your thing that does the less than and the and, and it handles pure, suspend, flat map, all this other stuff, so you never need to touch it, and then that will yield the right results. You always have to evaluate to something which has something like future or list, a type constructor, something that wraps up a value, though. And the way, and it's because the way uh, the types match up. Uh, but you can uh, evaluate to like just a raw value using this thing called the ID monad, which is a, a little hack. I'm, I won't talk about it. You can, there's a really good book called Scala with Cats that I co wrote. You can read about it in there. Um, there's a little tiny chapter on it which will explain everything in there. Okay. So the big thing here is free is providing our sequencing. The flat map part gives us the sequencing. We don't have to write that. Our algebra just gives the steps. And one of the really big things about this, and the big justifications for doing something like free, which I will just talk about very briefly and not really explain too much, is it allows us to combine different DSLs. So we've got this thing called free, which does the sequencing, and we have something we plug into free, which says, oh, it's less than or and. And we can easily add more terms onto that by combining things. So there's, a, for example, a type called either k in cats, which says, OK, I've got two different algebras, algebra 1 and algebra 2. Maybe algebra 1 is add and multiply. Algebra 2 is less than an and. And I can just say, well, I can have a third algebra, which is either algebra 1 or algebra 2. It's really just, you know, that means it's an add or a multiply or a less than or an and. And if I have that at every step in my program, then my flat map, my free uh, monad still works. If we had implemented flat map ourselves as part of our DSL, then and we try to combine two DSLs, then you have this problem about which flat map do you use at any given stage? Is it the one from the first DSL or the one from the second one DSL? But by factoring out the sequencing here, free gives us the sequencing uh, sequencing for everything, and we just plug in the steps. And there's a whole bunch of boilerplate around that, uh, and I, uh, there's a, a bunch of libraries. There's a bunch of stuff in cats, and there's this great library, 47 degrees library called Freestyle, which will sort of remove all that boilerplate. You never need to look at it. It's very idiomatic um, developing that. They've got good documentation um, on, on this library, so go check it out. OK, so that's, that's basically everything I wanted to say about, um, about uh, the, 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 the rarefied version of implementing DSLs. So basically, we turn code into a data structure, and we've talked about various different ways of handling type errors. We've talked about ways of doing sequencing, and that leads us, all that sequencing stuff leads us to having monads and the free monads. So now I want to switch gears. Oh, and the take home point, by the way, from the free monad stuff is I think it's all very complicated. <laughs> um, and I, I want to switch gears and sort of show an alternative encoding, an equivalent encoding, that actually gives us kind of the same things, but one of the big advantages of it is it's a, like a lower cognitive load. There's less boilerplate, there's less complexity, I think. So the idea of church encoding is that anything we can represent as a data structure, we can represent as a bunch of method calls, kind of. Um, so rather than encoding uh, programs as instances of a data structure, we're going to encode them as a bunch of abstract method calls, and then we're going to implement the methods and provide the, the details. So I'll give you two examples of this. The first one is just showing you how church encoding relates to what we just talked about. So if we have something like this, something like our expression, so I've just gone back to having a literal, a less than, an and, okay? Anything where I have this sort of seal trait, this um, sum type, co-product type, uh, sorry, sum type, uh, and you've got a set of possible subtypes, you can re-encode that as a set of method calls. So watch the board, boom. Okay, so I've still got um, uh, a, 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 an overall expression type. I've called it expression DSL. It's not a type anymore, really, so much as a library of methods. And then for every type I had in there, I now have a method call. And you see we've kind of got the same parameters, and we've got the same um, result types in there, pretty much. 
So if I've got all these, and these methods are all abstract, okay? So if, um, I have, if I want to implement a program in terms of these methods, I can just write a sequence of method calls without knowing how they're implemented. And so at a high level, I've kind of said what I want to do. So I can write something like this. It's the typical sort of pattern. Um, I'm going to take in an instance of my DSL type, which provides the methods that I can run. And then I'm just going to say, OK, these are the method calls I want in this order. OK, slightly weird having the, the import there, but that's just to make things you know, um, shorter, make the slide shorter. And then, um, so this, this is now a program. This satisfies all our requirements. It's an inert value. It doesn't do anything on its own, but it, it specifies what we want to do. Then we can plug in an interpreter, and the interpreter is the bit that tells us how to implement, how to execute the steps. So the interpreter is just a subtype of expression DSL. We, we implement that uh, abstract class, that trait, and we implement all the methods. Okay, and that gives some meaning to each step, and then we can call the inter call the program, pass the interpreter in, and that'll com that'll compute a result. So this is weird. This is kind of a weird thing that took me a while to get my head around. With the rarefied version, it's really sort of straightforward seeming. You build this data structure, this abstract syntax tree, and you pass it to the interpreter as an argument. That feel feels really natural. Here, you build your program as like a set of abstract methods calls, and you pass the interpreter to the program, or you pass the implementation of each step to the program. So it's kind of flipped, but it has the same effect. Um, and so this gives us this kind of separation of intent and implementation. Uh, but the way I've encoded it here is it's really restrictive. I can't abstract over effects. I couldn't make an asynchronous version of this. Okay, um, And that's just because the types are too specific. So, But we can do that if we just generalize the types a little bit. And this is where we come to tagless finally, tagless final encoding. I, I don't know which one the actual are. What is it? <laughs> so anyone know? Is it tagless final or finally tagless? Nobody knows. It's crazy, right? Okay, so <laughs> the idea here is we're just going to say, okay, in my DSL, rather than, rather than um, just return values in every step of the computation, I'm going to return some f of the value, some type constructor wrapped around the value. It doesn't matter what it is. You see, I've got it as a type parameter up there at the top. It could be anything. It could be option. It could be future. It could be whatever. And then when I build my interpreter, when I extend this trait and I provide all the, the meaning of all the steps, I can fill in what that f is. So I can have an interpreter like this that interprets to a future. And OK, it's a trivial implementation. This is not a very good example. Um, but you can see that, OK, now I have one that works for future. And maybe now I have one works that, that works for the ID monad. This is a bit of a weird one, but the, in principle, you can implement anything you want in there, any type constructor you want. And then, in your, and then the other thing is that um, a lot of these guys, I haven't um, introduced any, any sequencing in here. I've got a rogue square bracket there. That's a bit weird. Um, but I haven't, I haven't said how these things can be sequenced together. And the idea is that when you build one of these interpreters, you fill in a data type that has some kind of sequencing in it. So we can use a monad. So we can build a program which says, OK, I can run this sequence of steps f for any DSL for, of an F where F is a monad. F has an instance of monad. So if you import that, uh, if you import monad and you import this cats.syntax.flatmap, then that gives you this flat map uh, method on, on f, whatever f is. So if I want to run it with future, I pass in my asynchronous interpreter. And so when I pass in async interpreter, that's an interpreter of future. So f gets bound to future, and then this whole thing operates as a future. And if I want to do it with the id monad, I pass in the other interpreter. That says, oh, f is id. And then this whole thing works in id, and it works synchronously. And we can still combine DSLs with this approach, right? So if you want to build a program from two DSLs, you just have two parameters. You have to say, all right, I need them to be the same f, OK? So uh, if I'm dealing with future, I need to have an implement implementation of both DSLs that works with future. And that gives us the common flat map that we, had, we talked about earlier. You have the common flat map that was provided by free. It now just says, OK, well, whatever f we've got, this monad instance here is going to give us this flat map. So the kind of the big thing here is this is a lot lighter weight way of doing things than with free, in my opinion. There's a lot less boilerplate. 
uh, it's a lot easier to understand, I think, as a, as a Scala uh, developer. It feels like sort of object-oriented programming, but kind of um, stamped out in this very neat pattern. Um, and um, I gather there are performance Im improvements on that, but I'm, I'm not the right person to answer that. So I've got just a couple of minutes left. I'll, I'll wrap up and take some questions. So the kind of the idea of this talk was to just talk about different ways of building this interpreter pattern. And the big thing is program interpreter result. That's the, that's the thing. So whatever approach you use here, whether you do one, something right at the beginning of the talk or something from right at the end of the talk, this uh, um, separation can yield you all of these really great benefits in terms of reuse. Uh, and it's, uh, in fact, the, the tagless final encoding I now basically use in every project. It's really, really, really handy. Um, we talked about two major ways of implementing these things. Reification church encoding, which yield, go with, yield free and, and tagless final. I'll give you some references to read more about them in a minute. And as we went along, I kind of glossed over this towards the end, but the, 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 we have this sort of um, axis of, like from, um, if you've got like reification and church encoding as one axis in your design space, you have this sort of level of embedding as another axis in your design space. And really it's how many things in your language do you want to model yourself versus how many do you want to just pull straight from Scala. The more you pull from Scala, the easier life is, but the, the less sort of inspectable your language becomes. Okay, so here are a couple of uh, good links. This one on tagless final is a, 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 um, a London Scala user group talk by Chris Birchall. Um, it's on the Skills Matter website. This is an awesome talk where he describes tagless final and then implements a code base, like a fairly sophisticated code base, live in the talk. And it's really, really good. Uh, if you're interested in looking at the code, I've got this all on GitHub. There's a bunch of code samples um, that go, go through all these different implementations in a lot of detail. There's also some notes, some kind of like, f like long form text, which I'm still working on, but I'm hoping to flesh that out a bit. So um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>